everybody. Welcome to Tio's Roadhouse. Back in the man cave. In the house. Mitchell Ten Penny. What's up, my brother? Man, thank you for doing this. It's good of to course, see you. man. Thank you. I can't uh, can't complain when you when you get to come out in the fall and see this property with these trees, man. It's, oh man, and everything. The leaves you. are starting to change, and yeah. you know we've been cleaning up around the pond and just doing stuff out here. Man, yeah. fall is my favorite time of year. It really is. I think I Easily. like fall better than the spring. I love it when everything's waking up. There's something special about the yeah. fall. You're getting ready for hunting season. It's starting to cool off. Yeah, footballs in the air. It's, it's all that. It's, stuff. it's the best, man. There's a peace of mind in the air. I don't know what it is this nostalgia growing up in tennessee when i when it's fall it's i just feel better man i do everything you just said nailed it man and, right. and there, i think there's something special I, a lot of people talk about loving to live in florida where the sun shines all the time i like the seasons i, I want too, things yeah. to change you know i like it Absolutely. when it gets cold for a little bit but i'm ready when it's done i like amen. it when the flowers wake up in the spring amen but there's something about the fall you know going and sitting out in a deer stand on the opening day of deer season and and being out there when it's still dark and yes. feeling everything wake up. Uh, it's, it's, something the, so it's the amazing. greatest fee in the world. I tell people too, like like getting people into hunting, if they don't like, if they don't actually want to kill an animal, I'm like, just come out there and sit then. Oh, just yeah, come sit. a video watch, camera. Yeah, watch what happens like when, when it's completely silent and you, like it's dark and you watch the sun come up and you get to see every second of light. I mean, there's something truly yeah, spiritual and, and about that. Yeah, the birds wake up. Absolutely. The, the squirrels start to scurry around. And all the activity in the woods, there's, yeah. there's something very spiritual about that. Yeah, it's yeah, just, I it feeds it. the soul, doesn't it? It, it does mine, man. I tell you, yeah, I agree. I just found out something recently about you that I didn't know that uh, Donna Hilly was your grandmother. I knew her really well. Yeah, she was, oh, man. She's been here a long time, man. Rest wow. her soul. But Thank I got you. to work with her a lot over the years. She was, uh, she was a great lady. Thank you very much for saying that, man. Yeah, I'm... Miss her every day. That's awesome. I didn't know y'all knew each other. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I got here in the early '90s, and she was pretty much a force here in town. <laughs> yeah, she, she was. Uh, it was cool to see him, and that's. I mean, that's why I fell in love with it. Uh, you know, I got to meet Brooks. I got to meet you too. Like back then, Did way back really? in the day, I was a kid. Um, you, Tim McGraw, Brooks and Dunn. Um, you know, I was just kind of surrounded by that all the time, and then great songwriters. You know, she introduced me to like Bobby Braddock and Curly Putt and everybody like that, and it was like. I just wanted to be a songwriter. I mean, I thought it was did so you cool. really? I mean, did, did it get in you that early? How, how yeah. old were you when you started to feel that feeling like it's what you wanted to do? Yeah, around, I mean, around 11 or 12. Yeah. You know, she was grandmother. I knew she was always at Sony, and I would see all these cool people. I mean, I remember, like, Blake Shelton walking the hallways as just a songwriter, you know, like, trying to figure it out. And I didn't know. I just, I didn't really know what she does. She was grandmother. She was at my sports games and stuff, but I knew she was on always talking to people like you and, I just thought it was so cool, but then she told me, yeah, these are the guys that wrote He Stopped Loving Her Today, and, I, and that's when it clicked to me what a songwriter was, too. Yeah. I was like, oh, man, I didn't ever really think about that, that I just assumed all artists, you know, did their thing, and that really explained to me in that moment what this town was all about, and I was like, man... I want to be cool like y'all one day. Hopefully, <laughs> try. You know, and and uh, over the years, I've been here over thirty years. There's not a at, at least when I got here, most of the people that I met in the music business were not from Nashville. Yeah. So I I think that's changed a little bit over the years. Most people, you know, they they were kind of turned off by it. But you grew up <laughs> in it and still fell in love with it. I find that very fascinating because oh, you could have a lot of people want to get away from what they grew up with. <laughs> at least I did. That's true. <laughs> well, well, that's true. I got I got I was lucky. I was born here. I guess I bumped my head pretty early or something like that. <laughs> that's but. not a bad Thing. Yeah, man. What was the first song you wrote? <laughs> first, did you play it for Donna? Yeah, I did play <laughs> it. <laughs> but yeah, just obviously, I didn't know what a publishing deal was. Honestly, when I was doing that, I was I was just trying to, you know, see if I was any good and trying to impress my grandmother, you know. And it was, yeah. it was a song called "Be My Baby." It's so bad. I run baby crazy, you know. It's just what you do, and yeah, um, it was it was it was fun. It was fun. It was it was. She acted like it was awesome. And that's all I needed, man. That Just fire. that little bit of encouragement. Just that little bit of encouragement, and then, you know, you start a band the next day. That's <laughs> all you need. Oh, you like that? Okay. Who plays bass? Who plays drums? Who plays Let's Do It? And we did. We started did you Did you take guitar lessons, or did you just pick a lot of it up on your own? No, I just picked it up. Um, I had a cousin that kind of played that showed me how to play Blackbird, you know, Paul McCartney back yeah. in the day. And I, I just started noodling around and learning guitar tabs and just – Locking myself in my bedroom, man, and playing hours, with friends. Hours, yeah, man. absolutely. I was never really good at that. I, I took like two, and I just, my fingers weren't doing naturally what he wanted me to do. And it just, it was frustrating me. It was taking away the fun of it. Yeah. And so I quit that pretty early. And 
just started, like I said, locking myself in the room. You know, I was watching the thing on Marcus King the other day, and I've been a, I, I, I discovered him several years ago when he had the first album out that had a song called Carolina on it, and uh, he's he's really kind of exploded on the scene in the yeah. last few years. But he was talking about how you know he was he was actually a little bit insecure as a guitar player because he couldn't get his little finger to work oh, right, yeah. and he was having to right. shift up and things. But you find a way to navigate around it, man. Absolutely. But that's what gives you your own style, man. That's, I think so. You don't. Everybody's not going to be the best technical player but like that little weird finger might give you some just little, cut it off and get it out of the way yeah, some <laughs> little special timbre in your guitar playing i don't know so i love talking about songwriting too because I, I i remember being a kid and and listening to songs and trying to understand structure yeah. and and when i got to town i really thought i knew how to write a song until i met guys like paul nelson and bob yeah. piero and dean dylan got to write with those oh, guys and dude. craig wiseman and and then you you realize that you don't really know anything man and, <laughs> and it's yeah. it's like you get an inside master's class with some of those guys that teach you rhyme scheme and talk about structure and how to put things together yeah. how, how what was your process like really getting to that place where you really started truly understanding it well and that too that's the difference in like co-writing as well um man yeah like understanding it was you know getting to the opportunity to get in those rooms with some of those guys like like a craig a craig, excuse me craig wiseman the first time i got to get in the room with him i was so nervous obviously i knew you know everything he's done been watching forever and just felt like i was going to be like you know just embarrassing myself and he the first thing he did was he said, what do you got? You know, obviously, what do you got? What are you doing? And then the second thing he did was he listened. I was joking. I came up with a title, and he just started, all right, let's go with it. You know how Craig does it. He just starts kind of going, oh, little tough, starts all the time, doing the little thing right there. And then he'll come in and just give you, like, a whole line out of nowhere, and you're, like, waiting for him. You can't really talk to him. I was like, this is interesting. But then you start seeing how he, what he's doing, and he's trying to develop a sense of, like you said, structure first. He wants to know exactly where the song is going so that we can help benefit each other. And, we, and that's uh, that was where I learned the most important part about co-writing is like, I'll never forget he said too, man, if I don't know where you're going, I don't want to go with you. <laughs> and I was like, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. So let's establish exactly what we're doing first yeah. instead of just everyone being everywhere and wasting time in the room. And I, I took that with me every right since then. Yeah, and, and I'm sure you've been, you've experienced the same thing, getting in a room with somebody that just rambles and won't lock in on yeah. anything. You'll get going in a certain direction, and then they'll want to change gears and go someplace else. Yeah. It's so frustrating when you do that. It's it, not it, my, my style of writing. I like I like to lock in. Yeah, I like sure. to lock in, too. And I, I, I typically like to start with courses, too. I'll try to write the sure. course and get that thought process down first and then back up and, and start putting brush strokes on the imagery that leads up to the main meat of the song. Absolutely. That's, I'm, I'm very similar to you. I mean, I can do it the other way if that's where the room's going, but I like a chorus. I like a good hook. Let's nail it. And then we know exactly what we haven't said. Then you have something to yeah. write too. Exactly. So if you start from the head down, yeah. then, then really you don't, you're, sometimes it works out, but yeah. I like to get that thought down first and then, then you can kind of get up to it. It, it, it yeah, seems, there's, makes structure better to me. Well, yeah. And it's just, there's nothing worse than having a great verse in a not good chorus. So it's like, oh my, you leading me up to this. And then you're like, oh, never mind. We put all our effort into the beginning. Yeah. And so, um, I'm I'm right there with you. I love starting with a good hook and a good chorus, good melody, man. Melody too. I I need melody. I live on melody. I mean, you're a singer, so you know it's like that is so important to me. That's what generally locks me in first, and then I start listening to the lyrics. So that chorus melody is so important to me. I agree. What are a handful of of songs that you go back to in the '90s for inspiration? Maybe warm up things. What do you What do you gravitate back to when you ride around your truck? <laughs> man, I. I listen to just to see you smile all the time <laughs> here recently. Um, you know, old Tim's song. I love that train. The I don't know. I just kind of, it's kind of fun to sing that. Mark Nessler is a genius. Yeah, he is. I mean, that melody is so fun to sing. And yeah, that was Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and then I'm a big Brooks and Dunn fan, man. That those Don Cook records, early stuff, Ronnie's, um, you know, Ron, I went back and really looked at all the writers and saw how much Ronnie wrote by himself, too. Oh, and a lot of that stuff, from what I understood, Ronnie wrote a lot of that stuff before he even came to Nashville yeah. when he was playing in the bars in Oklahoma. Which is so cool to me. And I mean, he's one of my favorite voices of all time. Mine, too. He really is. Yeah, it's so unique. 
torn apart. It's that heart. He's just he just <laughs> he's so he's good, just man. such a solid singer, man. I still and I go back and listen to a lot of that stuff too. I love Ronnie's voice, power, range, control. I mean, he's got he's got all the tools. He's just a cool cat, man. Yeah, man. And then uh, I don't know for ninety 90s for me like that was kind of and then Randy Travis forever and ever amen. Yeah, I mean that one that one for me that was the melody of that. How linear it is. It and that stuff. It's just. It just sits so right. It's just easy. You don't have to overthink it. You can drive, and everyone can sing it. It's almost like a nursery rhyme. Yeah. Uh, I love that song to death, man. I love Randy, too, man. I, I got to know him before he went, had gone through all of his trouble, man, and, and he still comes out to shows when we play Billy Bob's. He'll come yeah. see me and hang out with him. He seems to be making progress, too. He does. I didn't get to know him that well at all before he got sick. I've actually gotten to know him or since he had his, you know, yeah. all, everything that went on, and uh, I've actually gotten to know him since then, which is hard to get to know somebody after that. But uh, yeah. he's been nothing but kind to me. He's come out at Billy Bob's and we've played, and it's always such an iconic moment, man. When when he comes out and finishes that, Amen. Like yeah. it's so emotional, man. Because he's uh, still got the fire in him, man. He's got it, man. Like yeah, if you're if you're taking the time to come out and still see shows and still do it, and um, and in that condition, and I think that's what's making him better, man. I think that you can tell because. Five years ago, when I first met him like that, it's, I mean, I think it's leaps and bounds compared I agree. to when I saw him. Last couple of years, ago. he's made huge yeah. progress where you can actually talk to him and, and, and yes, he can it, communicate back with you at this point. Absolutely. You know he's in there. Yeah, amen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, going back to uh, your teenage years, man, when you were dreaming about doing this for a living, what what was the dream? Did it consist of seeing your name on the marquee? Was it riding on the bus? Was it was it massive crowds? Was it being on TV? What what was your specific dream that you were dreaming of? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. I will say it was never seeing my name on a marquee. That was never for me. I I loved being in bands, and I loved being um, writing songs more than anything. I thought I was going to be a songwriter. That's what I started doing, but I was always playing in bands. I love playing on stage with my friends. I yeah. did, but I never thought Mitchell Tenpenny was the thing, like that was going to be the name on it. Like that was never it. And I just kept playing in bands and kept writing songs. And you know, Nashville, you get into songwriter rounds. I enjoyed that, so I was doing that all the time. And you know, the dream was I wanted cuts. I wanted cuts, and I wanted to hear my song on the radio. And uh, that's what I wanted more than anything. Like I thought songwriters again were the coolest people in the world. And so maybe that's probably because you grew up around you were exposed yeah. to a lot of it. That's that's a different, completely different side of the business than most people out in the public. Yeah, yeah. it is. I mean, I, I grew up in the publishing business. You know, I saw it and uh, I fell in love with it. And yeah, I wanted to do that. And I just wanted to have, you know, I wanted to be the guy kind of under the table. Like if you know, you know. Like he wrote that. Like you just said when I when I said you know just see you smile and you list out the songwriters. Like that's what I thought was cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, and that's what I was doing. And you know, a guy named Granger Smith cut my very first song, put it on the radio, called it The Boot Fits, and I had my first, you know, hit and song on the radio, and it kind of opened up a bunch of doors where I got into rooms, like, you know, with Craig Wiseman and uh, some of my heroes, you know, just, especially at this, to Bob DePiro, like you said earlier, like getting to write with some of those cats was insane, and, but I kept playing songwriter rounds, and people kept coming up saying, no, you need to do that song, that's your song, you need to do it, and I was like, man, I don't know, I just, I just kind of like this way, and I just was playing around one day and you know you never know who's in the room in nashville and there was sony and they offered a record deal and my brother barely played bass i said i said yes a record deal will you play bass with me here you go and he goes okay and then we've been doing it ever since and i love every second of it but it was never the plan man wow it was never the plan to do mitchell tenpenny it was the plan to do whatever nashville let me do Bands that you were in, were you the front man? Or you guitar player? What were you playing? Were you always the front man? Most of the bands, I was a drummer. Uh, we, we, I was in some hardcore screaming bands. I really? like metal music. So I screamed a little bit, sung a little bit, but mainly drummer in most of those bands. Wow, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> wow. Dave Grohl. <laughs> <laughs> man, that's that's one of my heroes right there for sure. Boy, he's um, had quite the journey, hadn't he? I've uh, not yeah. met him. Have you had a chance to meet him? I have, I've met him one time, super fast. Yeah. He was not... You know, you know when you meet your heroes fast, like they could be whatever. He was very nice, you know, but it was so quick. So I have not really gotten a chance to do anything with that. You've uh, you've had the opportunity to be on some pretty big freaking shows. Give me a couple of highlights over the last five years as you've been doing artist things. <sighs> Man, that, that's the craziest. They let us play 
in these places. Like, I, I, like from the Ryman, getting to headline the Ryman, getting to sell out two nights in a row at the Ryman, getting asked to play the Opry. Yeah. I mean, these things in Nashville are, I, I don't know, they're spiritual to me. Like, those are things that I grew up seeing um, and, and just falling in love with and dreaming, truly dreaming about doing that one day and whatever form that looked like being on that stage. And, you know, I've gotten to play the stadium, the Titan Stadium with Luke Holmes. Um, you know, I've been on tour with Luke Bryan, Jason Aldean this year still. I mean, just just playing stadiums, arenas, the gorge out in Washington, you know, just crazy venues. And and just I was a fan, so I've been in the st- seats. And so these opportunities to get to be the person that's on that stage is, you know, it's overwhelming for me. Um, it's It's, you know, we all can take things for granted and we do it every day, but I think when you ask that question, just immediately it floods back in. Like, how how in the hell? I love to see that we on trick, you, too. Did we trick people? It's that genuineness uh, because it's still, and I, I say this a lot, if you're getting into this business because you want to get rich or you want to see your name on the marquee, then you're chasing the wrong dream. Oh, because man. if you don't have that fire down here, this business will chew you up and spit you out. Man. It can be a brutal, brutal thing if you don't do it for the right reasons. But if you're passionate and you truly love it down in your soul, you'll fight through all kinds of stuff to keep doing it. Because it gets yeah, in man. you. The hardest thing for me was when COVID hit and we had to take a year off. I had a real hard time decompressing because I'd yeah. never taken that kind of time off. Right, I'd always yeah. work. I really, I, I mean, it was, it, it affected me. It was really hard. Wow, you man, go through, yeah. I mean, you were, how long, you've been out a couple of years before COVID hit, haven't you? At least two. Yeah, uh, in the, in this, like, in this country music record deal since it had been, we've been going for about five years hard on that. But, you know, I was touring with bands and stuff before that, but it's, you know, there was there was definitely like because we were on our way to London for the first time. We were on a plane, and we heard on the plane that um, the world is shut. They're about to travel ban, and so we were all a little nervous too. It was wow. me, Jordan Davis, Luke Holmes. So we land in London. We go outside. We flip the camera off, and then we go back in and get on a flight back home. And wow, we all like thought it was going to be like a two week break, and so we were like. Yeah, we've been tired this two weeks. We'll take this two weeks, and that became four weeks and four months. And then I started just like you, man. I started kind of going crazy. Yeah, I thought I wanted a break, and I did not. My body did not. My mind did not. My well, it's like a drug to me, yes. and it's hard to explain to somebody. There's something that you get back from that crowd, from live performances when you get on the stage in front of those crowds. That energy, that when you get off the stage, it's that freaking rush that you carry with you, and you don't realize how it gets inside of you. Oh, man. But when it's taken away from you, it's it, there's a there's a period of depression and decompression that you go through. Oh man, I, I found that I had that, and I had no idea th- yeah. the anxiety that I had that I've never had before of. Fear of missing out, that FOMO, the fear of becoming irrelevant, all this hard work, the fear of your band and everyone that's believed in you, that's gone with you, that's missed birthdays and births and everything for you might not have a job and you can't take care of them. Uh, that really weighed on me, man. It really did. That I'm right there with you. Um, that was that was tough. And like you said, the drug for me too. Like I don't know if this is for you. Like on stage is one thing and it's incredible, but that. Last downbeat when you're walking off, there's this high that like Always. it like smacks you so hard that like even more energy than when I was up there. I know that sounds so weird, but it's like like you just did it and it's like you you get to relive it real fast, like on there on that walk to the bus back, you know, it's just that high. I don't know. I missed that so much, man. And so now being on the road, I that's what we remind ourselves of. I mean, let me say it, F COVID, whatever I can say, but there was a little bit of that that I needed in my life to know how how easily this could all go away. I came out of it with a much it. better appreciation yeah, than I side too. I, I did. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it, it was almost as hard to get the engine fired back up because it's like after you stop for so long, I didn't. I, I swore that I wasn't going to get back on the treadmill that hard, but I, it's worse now. Than it was. <laughs> right. You just can't. You can't yeah. stop, man. I can't right. say no to things, and you know I want to be out there. I want to. I want to yeah. be moving all the time. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, brother. That's a uh, yeah. We're How do you similar. so? Outside of that, when you uh, when you get off the stage, when you have downtime, what do you what do you do to decompress? Outside of writing songs and all that other yeah. stuff, what, what what do you do? Man, this uh, this place out here is the dream. I try to get out to a place as peaceful as this, out outside, outdoors. Whether it's golf, <laughs> which sometimes could help me not decompress, <laughs> depending on how I'm playing. Yeah. But golf, uh, hunting and fishing, just being outdoors. And that's what I love about my wife. She loves that, too, so it's easy to do. Um, but, like, getting out away from from the noise, man, and just hearing the outdoors is 
it's a reset for me. It always has been. Yeah. Um, so that's what I like to do. I like to just get out in peace and quiet and just turn my phone off and, like I said, play golf or frisbee golf or uh, hunting and fishing, man. That's that's kind of my thing. You do any saltwater fishing at all? Uh, a few times when we were in Florida. Uh, I'd probably say 10, 10 or so. Yeah. Caught a couple of sharks and some other other crazy stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm landlocked in Nashville. And my whole life, like, before music, we didn't go anywhere. We, we went to Kentucky. And then we'd go to like Florida for vacation, but we didn't. My family didn't like do that kind of fishing. This, this has all been the last ten years of my buddies out saltwater fishing. So yeah, but there's the great yeah. lakes here, man. You've got Center Hill, you got Kentucky Lake, you got Old Hickory, Percy Priest, yeah, Tim's Ford know. out there. I love too. There's so. and uh, we we like to go to Junior Derek lives down uh, in Perry County, right on oh, Buffalo. Yeah. So I we like to buffalo. kayak yeah. down there. We do a little kayak trips from time to time. Take a group. Down. I love a good kayak canoe, especially this time right now. I mean, you can. You put up in the Harpeth right there by Moran. And Throw your out. feet up with a nice chest. Yeah, and absolutely, man. there and cast. The water's not moving too much. It's kind of easy. Take about long. three hours, just float and look around, Shoot man. Shoot your chest, son. Rip some lips on some smallies now. There you go. There's some, there's some good smallmouth in there. Absolutely. My favorite river around I wouldn't need them, but. The duck. <laughs> the duck is, is, have you been on the duck yet down at, at Columbia? Yeah, I've never fished it, but that, yeah. What a great little river, man. Huge uh, ecosystem, man. A lot of mussels and different things. Just a very diverse yeah. ecosystem there. It's a beautiful lake. A beautiful river to get on and that's what i love about tennessee there i mean you go east all the way all the way to west and then you start duck hunting out there i mean we yeah. we got a great state here i love it yes we do i enjoy a whole lot i can't imagine living anywhere else i mean i've traveled a lot but there's no place else i want to be in right here yeah this is home back to like what you said like i just ended up in the right place man i think if i wasn't i would have found my way here i truly believe that um but i was born right here in nashville and just there's no reason to move that's awesome man yeah so uh your uh, song out, uh, we got history. Yeah, did you write that? I did. Yeah, I write. Uh, I co-write everything that I put out, unless that song comes. I'm always open to outsides, but I just haven't had one yet. I try. I had one one time, but I couldn't get it from the other artist, so uh, <laughs> I ended up not cutting that. Um, but yeah, we wrote. Me, and my buddy Andy Albert, Jordan Schmidt, and Devin Dawson, who are all three of my best friends. Who we, you know, who and I want to know too from you. Who'd you come up like? Who was your your best friends you came up with, riding with, artists, oh. and those are my cats that I came up with. We all got our first cuts, first record deals, everything together, and so we still make it a priority to write. Yeah, uh, I wrote a lot with Kenny Beard and Paul Nelson. Paul Nelson is retired now. He was yeah. a Sony writer with their yeah, fingers. Know, yeah. Kenny Beard's passed away, rest his soul. Uh, Elbert West, I uh, wrote a lot with Elbert. He was a co-writer of Sticks and Stones early on. Elbert's, Elbert's passed away. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older, so I've seen a lot of, a lot of people move on, but I, you know, I remember the first time I got to write with Dean Dillon, I've only written with him a couple of times. He scared the crap out of me, you know, cause he likes to intimidate you, Yeah, you know, and you go in the room with Dean, it's like he wrote unwound and all that early straight stuff, yeah, which geez. was huge influence on me. And just being in the room with Dean, you know, it's, it was like, he's so intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that because I've never written with Dean. I want to, but I heard uh, in the BMIs when he was taught when Kenny Chesney was talking about Dean when they when Dean got in, uh, yeah inducted or whatever. Yeah, and Kenny's like it was my first ride with Dean, and I remember I'll never forget. I sat down and he looked at me and he was just dead silent. He looked at me a while and he goes, "You're gonna have to give me a minute, boy, because I." I got to get down to your level. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. And I was just like, and that, oh, that'll man. intimidate the crap out of you when you're. Kitty said, "I just sat there and I felt even smaller than oh, I." Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, and I got I got to write with Hank Cochran a lot early oh, wow. on, and I need to go back through and dig a lot of those old songs out before uh, before Hank passed away. So I, I mean, he had a cabin up in uh, up in Gatlinburg, up in East Tennessee, and we would go up there and spend like three days at a time and just knuckle down and ride. Just yeah. That, well, that's where we. That's how we got these songs. We go to Gatlinburg in a little cabin. Just make a little riders retreat and Absolutely. go away and just 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 woodshed up and just ride a bunch of <laughs> That's stuff. That's awesome you do that. Yeah. yeah. It's it's peaceful up there, man. I love the mountains. There's something about just being up there in nature that just it changes your perspective. It pushes yes. everything away, especially if you come up there and I I don't ride all the time, but I I keep my I Take it with my notes in my phone, man. I keep a whole list of songs. Anything that jumps out at me, I'm, I'm keeping song ideas down all the time. Yeah. That way I've got at least something to bring to the table when I show up at a write. And I like yes. co-writes more than writing by myself. And I do yeah. write by myself from time to time, but I prefer co-writes. I like the collaboration. Me, me too. It's now in full circle when we were talking earlier, it's like now that you know how 
uh, great co-writing is. But when you didn't, before you did it first, you're like, no, I know everything. But then once you start getting in the room, you're like, oh, how much better the songs are when uh, I get someone else's perspective outside of mine. Absolutely. It's and so much fun for me. You know, I, I've shared this a couple of times, but but I think it's it's noteworthy to do with songwriters that understand, especially songwriter artists. You know, I, I never realized what a big impact music that came from me could have on my family. Mm. And as big as te- Time Marches On was, yeah. when I released Time Marches On, I cut it because I thought it was an amazing lyric. Bobby Braddock wrote it by himself. It's, it's talking about th- multiple generations of a family. But do you know what that put my father through? Because it says the line, Daddy's got a girlfriend yeah. in another town. And it, it, it caused him a lot of problems because everybody back home thought I wrote it and thought it was about my family. Wow, and it man. tormented him. He hated that song. And it never dawned on me when I cut that song what impact it would have on him. Jeez. So, and, and I use yeah. that leaning into being in a room and writing songs. You come in with an idea, and I've got several of them uh, that have been about my kids or about relatives or different things. And I've learned to be a little bit more abstract where it's sure. where you might have the idea, but you're not using specific things. And, and co-writing with people, you're able to take other things that they bring to the table. So it's not exactly parallel with the idea that right. you had it just has all and it seems to it allows you to create more colorful imagery when you're writing a song if you have other perspectives in the room i found yeah wow man i'm that's crazy too i know that my my wife has a song that she had just recently told me that you know her her family kind of took it hard you know uh, some of the stuff it said and uh and that's wild because I, we don't think about that in the moment. It's not always like he, uh, hear truck, see truck to us. It's sometimes we want to create a story that's... And we embellish. Embellish, exactly. Yeah. It's like writing a movie. Like it's, You don't always have to play the part of the character, but you don't realize that you are inevitably. Like I heard a Luke Combs song yesterday, and it's talking about his brother that, that he lost and all this stuff. Luke's an only, only child. Yeah. But for a minute, it made me think. I was like, did he lose his brother this song? But it, like... So I get that it's it's fun to go to a different place, but you never really think about what your family is actually thinking about that because people don't always realize that it's just a song. Sometimes, sometimes you're just writing a story that's in your head. It doesn't have to be something direct to your life. But um, that's interesting, man. I'm I'm sorry. I mean, what a song! What a song! What a song for you! I mean, yeah. that isn't that what songs do, right? That's what they do, you know. But you know, you're right. People, uh, a lot of times, people out there, they get wrapped up in a sitcom and they think those characters are real too. Right, they yeah. have a hard time separating that out into the real world. Uh, but but when you're a young artist and you're you're trying to find the best songs that you can, sure. I mean, I mean, when something like that comes across your lap, you don't turn that down. And I didn't even <laughs> think about that. I mean, that was the first time anything that I'd recorded had that kind of impact on my family. Yeah, I haven't had any time marches on songs dropped in my lap <laughs> that, uh, yeah you might have to cut an outside that, song that, if that, that, one, if that one came my way i'm sorry i think that would have been really easy for me you know why i cut <laughs> that at that time man you know uh country music has evolved a lot in the last 10 years man and it's uh it's pretty opened up where you can say a lot more and the tracks are a lot more aggressive and more rock and roll sure. but back then to say the word smoking dope in a yeah. song was shock factor oh, and yeah. i knew that that was the primary reason that i cut that song because i knew it would either just shock them into it being a massive hit or it'd blow up in my face man i remember i, mean, I remember how i felt when i heard that line yeah being like oh my gosh on, on, it's radio. on the radio on because, radio because yeah. the album before uh i had a song called if the world had a front porch i had yeah. radio stations that wouldn't yeah. play it because it said the word cuss didn't have to say a cuss what? word. Really? I had Kim in Tucson that wouldn't play it because it said the word cuss. And you remember Kim I, in Tucson. Yes, I do. <laughs> Sorry, Kim. You remember those things. I definitely oh, do. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still trying right now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. Uh, wow. Man, but yes, I and I loved that song because of when uh, Time March, because of how real it was, man. And that groove, too. I'm, I'd love to hear the demo. I know Bobby still... He still goes to Sony, still hires the same players and does yes, demos man. the same way. I'd love to hear that that boom. Dude, I got to do the N- Oh, I, just, I got to do the NSAI yeah. songwriters thing at uh, the Ryman the other night. And uh, they asked me to walk Bobby out on stage for his recipient speech. I did Time Marches on. Blake Shelton did uh, uh what did he do? 
He did a, he did a Braddock song. Toby Keith was there and he did How Do You Like Me Now. Yeah. Uh Garth was there. So we all we all were there and, and kind of went out with Bobby for him to do his speech. And it was one of the coolest things to be able to do. Oh, I'd love to that. see that. You no, know, he's had number one records in five decades. <laughs> Fifty years of number one songs that man's written. All the way back to Golden Rings. And he stopped loving her day. He and stopped loving her day. God I mean, is the, great. Beer is good. People are crazy. The list is like. endless, man. He's just had so many. Ma I'm not talking about mediocre hits. I'm talking about things that anybody would kill to have just one of those in their songwriting career. It's uh, I mean, that's what inspires you as a kid, man. That's like when I'm. That, I said I'll never forget when she and my grandmother introduced me to him, and I just, you know, he's got his little eyes shut and. He's looking at you, and he's kind of giving you advice, and it just felt like so much wisdom was being poured on me. Oh, yeah. You walk into Sony still <laughs> now, man. All the pictures of all those guys on yeah. the wall, man, those are legends. Yeah. Those are true industry legends that most people outside the industry don't really know who they are, but they're legends to me. I will, same to me, and that that is the thing when you have so many new cats coming in, which I love, but they have no idea about the history. And I know I was spoiled with that. But I like getting to talk to you and hear some of these names. Like I don't get to talk about these names yeah, to most of my friends anymore because yeah. they're like I don't know, and that's not their fault. They weren't here and they're trying to do something. I get it. I'm not making fun, but I really truly enjoy this talking about that Nashville. I, I love talking about it. And I love talking <laughs> about the studio stuff too. Yeah. You know, um, uh, so it seems like music kind of evolves and changes. So you know. Uh, we had a huge run in the 90s, and then it started getting a little soft by the end of the 90s, and then the new decade rolled around. It kind of it kind of got rejuvenated, and there was a lot of new artists come in. The songwriting was getting more aggressive, and then we went through our bro country period. You know, yeah. like it, don't like it, whatever. Yeah. It changed a little bit, but you've seen music evolve a lot, and, and I, how do you feel about where it's at? I, I mean, I've seen music. It seems like it's starting to come back full circle, and there's more yeah. traditionalism coming back. At, you know, like uh, like Laney. Uh, yeah, man. She wrote the bulk of that record. That is a good record, and it's country. It's fresh country. It doesn't yeah. sound dated. How, what, do you, what do you like, and what do you feel about what's out there? I love when it's authentic either way. Yeah. Laney is authentically that. Yeah. Um, and I've love Lainey her whole group like her Casey Tyndall who we're talking about who I love um uh th those that attitude of that those girls like Megan my wife's one of them they're like when she came here her first friend she made were Lainey and Casey yeah and they were and I watched those girls hustle and go and then the world finally got it it's like oh my gosh Lainey Wilson's incredible here you go and so that I love when it's authentic no matter what side of the country sh spectrum it is from very traditional to more pop rock, whatever it is, is if I feel it and I think you're authentic, I think it's country. To me, country's always been songwriting, storytelling. Yeah, you know the timbres, the, the you know the production elements are always going to change. But to me, I see true country by based on your songwriting, what sto kind of stories you're telling, and if I believe it. And it's always been evolving. I I remember hearing people complain. You go back to the mid eight, early eighties and stuff, and people say, oh, "I can't stand Sawyer Brown. Alabama's too pop. <laughs> Alabama's Rogers too pop." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, I, I was yeah. I was playing in cover bands. I mean, just getting my legs underneath me back then. <laughs> and and you might do feel so right. You might do a couple of ballads, but most of the stuff, everybody's like, "I go play that Alabama stuff." But they were huge, <laughs> man. They, they were, were freaking huge artists. They were but, huge, man. Yeah, and I mean, they sound like the band kind of too, like in in certain ways. But it's like. Harm, I don't know. I, but it ebbs and flows, man. It definitely does. I mean, but, Gar, but Gar's too pop, too right. You know, it's country's a melting pot, which is absolutely. the thing that I love about it the most. I mean, it's uh, if you're passionate about it, you can be accepted. If you're yeah. talented and passionate, amen. amen. That's all, and that's all. That's where I'm at, man. I try to do a little bit of everything, um, but it always comes back to, like I said, the songwriting and the storytelling. Yeah, that is what country is. Can you, can you paint me a picture? You know, paint me a Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> Which I just found out, by the way, from Chris Young that that uh, the Birmingham is not actually a. We're not talking about Birmingham. Am I right or wrong? It's, it can be anything you want it okay, to be, sure. but I, I really believe the song was uh, Birmingham is a style of house, right? Yeah. And, but but really and true, that's what makes it such a great song. It's like it could be it could be about Birmingham. It could be about the metaphor of what yeah. Birmingham stands for. It could be about the house. Maybe that was the place you go back to. But that was one of the things that I think made it so captivating to yeah, people. Was trying to understand what it's about. Everything can be too spelled out that it loses sure. its magic. And when there's a little mystery to it, it makes it more special. And yeah, well, that one's 
that one's up there with one of the all times for me, brothers. Oh, yeah. That was a good one, man. So you got uh, you got some big stuff coming. Are you almost done with your tour right now? You got a few shows? Yeah, we finish. Uh, I leave right after this. Uh, finish two, our last two with Jason Aldean. That tour has been amazing. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I take two weekends off to do weddings for You're my going friends. out with Marin Morris next year? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, she didn't invite me, unfortunately. <laughs> um, she did not invite me out next year, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't be going. I'll be going with Luke Holmes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the two, the two complete opposites there. Uh, Aldine to Marin, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I could do it. So you got Luke next year, and uh... yeah, doing Luke Holmes, and then me and Jordan Davis are going to do one together, and then uh, we'll do our headline in the fall. So already set up for a fun tour here, man. So you'll do the whole first half of the year, and then you're going to do your first big headline tour next fall? Yeah, I mean, we've done headlines. Like, we got to, you know, but this will be, you know, we're trying to step up to the next, you know, ticket range and hopefully up, up be able production, up, up bigger do it all, yeah. Just put a package together, the whole thing. Absolutely, yeah. We've done, we've done, you know, smaller clubs, like biggest, you know, 2000 area, but we're going to try and see. At some point, you got to, it makes me so nervous. You got to try to go to that next thing. And, and yeah. so that'll be. That'll be the goal next year. And it's scary, too, because there's so much competition for for family dollars out there. I mean, not just music. So much. genre of music and, and monster trucks and how to track <laughs> yeah. bulls oh, and yeah. fairs and festivals and all of it, man. It's it's a scary thing to step out there into. It is. There's just a lot, a lot of music now. Um, you know, back in the day, going to a record store or something, you had, you know, 300 400 things to choose from now you got 300 400 million things to choose from yeah and we're like a, i like to say we're a tender swipe away on spotify and stuff it's like next 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 and so it's really hard to keep people's attention and like you said there's just a lot of a lot of things to see now and it's like finding the way to keep people um wanting to come back to your show instead of saying wow well, i like that artist i love them i've seen them i want to see somebody else yeah and how do you get them to come back and that's all part of learning in this new world, and uh, it's it's scary, it's fun, um, and that's what we're going to try to do next year. So, how uh, how do you approach all your social media stuff? Label handle a lot of that stuff for you. You're pretty engaged, man. I, I'm 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 right in the middle of it. I love I I love the access when like to get out, but I hate the time it takes to do it, the time it takes away, and what you have to do to be in your phone. And TikTok and all that stuff. I will say it chose my last single, Truth About You, that ended up going number one for me. That like if I hadn't have posted it on TikTok and it didn't go viral, the label wouldn't have heard it and we wouldn't have done it. And yeah. it, you know, so I definitely got to give credit to stuff like that. But that's where it comes down to that fake genuine thing. I don't genuinely love being on my phone recording myself doing things. Like hey, man. I don't. <laughs> I understand the necessity, and I will do it. That's part of our job. We have to do things, and um, but when you but what I do love is reading comments um, and being able to connect with fans that instantly. I think that is special, and people being able to DM you um, and tell you stories. You know, like you know when people and I, I don't want to get too serious, but when people have you know told me, "Hey, this song literally kept me from killing myself." Wow. I mean, you you, you sit down and you just you become this small, you tear up and you're like, Jesus, man, that's, that's why we do this. It's also you know? pretty heavy to, to feel like that, uh, you don't, you don't come into this thinking that you're going to have that kind of responsibility. Absolutely. I mean, that's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, man. I know you've got, and it's, it's just stuff. Yeah. It's not why you pick up a guitar as a kid <laughs> for sure, but it's, uh, it's definitely so gratifying to know that someone else out there found a song that helped them just like I, I had songs that helped me. And, um, yeah, just to be a small part of that is is what keeps you going and and makes you get on the social media because you have to because it's you know it's the world we live in now. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not the best at it, but I'm trying to get better and try to find my balance of how to do it right. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I keep a lot of it over here, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I don't do radio anymore, so that that take that's taking a lot of that off me too. So. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that was a lot, yeah. and yeah, but. This is fun. I mean, look at the. But this guys, is. But I've been watching you when I'm scrolling social media, and I see that I watch every every single one that you do. It's it's intriguing because I love hearing you talk. Your voice is awesome too on mic, so it works. Well, thank you. <laughs> but I, I I started doing this because I wanted to find something that I was comfortable with that I enjoyed, and I love getting to know people on a different level. Yeah. 
Uh, and you know, we pass each other at shows. We're all busy and we've done festivals and stuff together yeah. and come over and hung out on the bus and stuff, but to sit down and have a really lengthy conversation, we don't yeah, get to do that out on the road. Yeah, man. Thank you for that thing. too. I'm honored by it. Yeah. I've come and hung on your bus. <laughs> <laughs> Cole Ford never tell me or told me that he said, you got off the bus. He said, man, I, I love Mitchell, but don't you ever take me on his bus again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had, we've had a couple of good times, man. And, and, uh, I got to do some stuff with you and Chris Young on yeah. uh, Chris record that was very cool too. i told you my mom um so my mom that's great that's donna hilly's uh, daughter so she's grown up in the business and she's seen it all and uh, i always try to impress my mom right but like i play these songs i can get a number one song and my mom's she's so happy for me don't get me wrong but it's nothing's gonna make her dumb and do car wheels but when you toasted me in that music video i think it's the only time <laughs> that anything i ever did <laughs> mattered to her <laughs> that's it's like funny. I could have all I can I can I can do you know all this stuff, but no. When when you gave me a toast in the video, it blew her mind because you're so cool. <laughs> so I was like, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Mama. I felt the same way, by the way. And uh, but thank you. I'm glad that's what it took. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> awesome. That's pretty. Funny. Have you ever written a song? And I've done this, and and you know we're uh, we we're very emotional about the things that we're creative on. Especially, I've yeah. come home and been been so proud of something. It's like, honey, look what I wrote. That I'm so proud of this song. She goes, <laughs> "I'll never play anything for you again." Oh man, <laughs> have you have you experienced that with people that you love? Or yeah, you're so proud of something. They go, <laughs> "Yeah, I'm married to a songwriter." <laughs> That's the worst. We it, play it cuts, yeah. don't it? Oh, it, it kills me because I'm like, "Oh, you're a songwriter. You'll get it." And it's like mm, I've heard that before. <laughs> It's like, oh shit! It's like, that's, it just cuts you. What do you know? Cord on it. Yeah, I'll never play anything for you again. <laughs> my, mine's my manager too. Sometimes because I love her to death. Her name's Kristen, and she is incredible. And she's such a good song person too. And like yeah. when she loves one of my songs, it just it gets me going, man. I'm like, all right, like because I I trust and value her opinion. But when she doesn't, I do not trust and value her opinion. <laughs> What do you know? <laughs> what do you know? I was really proud of that. You just kicked my legs out yeah. from underneath me. You must be having a bad day. Listen later. I don't know. Like, it, it is funny how we can go on a roller coaster like that, it man. Really, but but you, you get passionate and connected to things when you yeah. put your heart and soul in it. You spend four to six hours crafting a song, and you come home, you're proud yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, and there's also something in the room, too, that's happening that people outside the room don't understand. Like, yeah. that song becomes a part of that day, too. Oh, Sometimes yeah. it's like it's almost like a, like a long therapy session you're not having to pay for <laughs> because really when you go sit down yeah. with people you're especially a song that has some personal overtones to it you're really purging a lot of things you're kind of yeah, yeah. cleansing your soul a little bit when you're riding absolutely I, I dig the whole thing tell me about your charity <laughs> stuff you uh, have a cornhole yeah. tournament and I could make a lot of jokes but I won't <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you call it bags or cornhole first off where you well doing? I'm a washer player and we'll okay, washer, yeah. so I've got washer boards all over the place here but we we started doing it at the beach I play cornhole but I like washers better I yeah mean, that's, that's me and my cool. granddad used to play washers yeah cornhole I just, it's you know everyone everyone can kind of just play it that's yeah. why you know Great, golf anything. tournaments are amazing and I and I love yours and thank you for coming out there but like getting bad golfers out there is always the worst thing to do yeah. so like for me I'm, I'm going to try to work it up to a golf tournament but right now it's uh, starting with something easy throw a bag <laughs> but no man we got the 10 penny fun I, I got to start I, I lost my father to cancer uh my aunt's going through it right now. My mom got diagnosed two years ago uh, with breast cancer. But actually, on my birthday this year, called me saying she's cancer-free, which is awesome. Awesome. But it has um, completely surrounded my life. And um, so I wanted to start something to help with cancer. But I know that, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of that. And we don't have to get into big pharma and all this stuff. But, I, you know, I believe there's a cure. But I also believe that they, you know, make a lot of money treating it. So to, oh, me, yeah. to me, wasting money going into science of it and to go into the you know any anything else is is kind of a waste to me what i saw in in cancer especially but in life preparing yourself mentally to go for that battle is um everything so what we what we focus on is the mental health when you hear you have that disease so whether that's paying for therapy or that's giving you access to talk to somebody whatever that is i want that dollar to go directly to you to help you get right up here to go find it. How do you uh, select your recipients? We are actually just right now, we will start at the beginning of the year. We've been doing this for four years, created the, the fund. You got a 501c3. Yeah, yeah. All, yeah. So we so are. A committee and a board of people and everything. Yeah. So we are um, We are just about to release the money. I, I made it 
to start doing that starting next year because I made sure I do not want a single dollar going somewhere that I don't know where it's going. Amen. Because these people have given up their hard-earned money for a cause, and it's my duty to make sure it goes to that cause. So I was very, very adamant about that, and so it's all going to start next year, and we're going to find the best way to approach it the way uh, – the way it should be, which is honest, and that dollar is going to go to help somebody. So, how many recipients have you had so far? So that's what I'm saying. We're just literally. Yo, so you've so, just yeah. been you yeah, really- we just been collecting. We got we got to the amount that we need to like start that. Gotcha. You no, know, you, when you when you do it, you have no idea what you're doing. Like I was, and, learning, and I was like, I'm that, starting a charity. Uh, that uh, uh, kind of treatment outside of the medical field can probably be pretty dang expensive. That's that's what we're finding out because um, it was going to start in so so many different ways, and I'm like. Because, like I said, when you're starting it, you don't really know what you're doing. You just want to do it for a good cause. And then it's, and then it becomes, oh, my gosh, we have this money. I want to make sure it goes to the right place. Like, how do we do it? And then you got to start hiring people and figuring things out. And like, um, Which I would love to talk to you some other time outside about it because uh, very interesting. We've learned a lot over yeah. the years. I mean, yeah, I'm still learning. But, um, uh, yes, we uh, our plan is to start distributing the money to families or to recipients at the beginning of this year, which I'm very excited about. So, yeah. You know, I agree with you, and we can go down the rabbit hole a little bit if you want to. I, I, I believe they have a cure for diabetes. I believe they have a cure for cancer. I, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of treatment outside the United States, which is why people go. Uh, there's stem cell treatments down in Panama. There's there's, yeah. there's cancer treatments in Mexico. Uh, I've got a, a friend in Louisiana that has a son with cerebral palsy. They just went down and did a month long treatment on him, a uh, brain stimulation thing that seems to be having a tremendous effect, but none of it's FDA approved in the United States. Right. I think the drug companies that we have in this country are more about making profits than they are about healing people. They don't want to heal yeah. you. They want to medicate you. No, of course. And it's I mean, frustrating to watch. It is because I lost my dad to it. I lost my uncle to COVID. Yeah. You know, I lost my uncle to COVID early stages Did because... really? I didn't know that. Because, yeah, my dad's brother who, you know, was, it just, it was at the very beginning of COVID. We're like... Like Diffie. I mean... Like, like Diffie, yeah, same. Oh, broke rest my heart. In, rest in peace, man. Um, I put him in my song, Bigger Mistakes, because it's... Anyway, I just, I saw, I saw like they lock him in a room, can't see his family and all. The best thing you got is oxygen. I can watch South Park on an airplane on my cell phone, but the best thing you got is oxygen. I don't know. Sometimes I'm not going to go too crazy, but sometimes it gets a little in my head and it frustrates me. And I just like, well, what all I can do is what I can do. And again, I think the mental state of things is very powerful in so many different things in life. And so that's all I can, all I know that I can do to help is that. Yeah, and, and I think as we grow up and, and we see those kind of things, if you find something that's passionate, lock in on it and don't get too. It's it's kind of like going back to being in a room with a songwriter that doesn't know how to focus on things. Focus your energy on what you can deal with and, and stay targeted on that because if you get to yourself too fragmented, you're not helping anybody. Absolutely, man. That's And that's just being smart and aware. Yeah. I mean, it is. Things are what they Adulting are. Adulting is hard. Adulting, man. <laughs> I still, I'm like, God, yeah, man, I'm still just a kid trying to figure out this guitar thing, man. And, and I, now you got all the weight in the world on your shoulders. And yeah. I uh, think you're doing all right, brother. Thank you, man. I pretty well. You're thank right. you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm proud for all the success you have, and the, you. and proud to call you my friend to get and to know you over the last too. few years, and then to see all the <laughs> success you have. I was really blown away the first time that I saw you on stage when we, one of the shows that we did together. I didn't realize what a good guitar player you were. I had no idea. Oh, thank you, man. I, mean, I, I stood out there and watched that. Look at this. Come oh, on, thank man. You, man. I'm faking it, dude. Just I'm, aren't we all? <laughs> just faking it, man. Just yeah. When well, well, it's I appreciate that. And, but when you grow up in Nashville and you see these guitar players, it just it don't matter how good I think I am, man. I'm never going to be anywhere close to some of these. Characters. Yeah, when you just... get uh, you know with Tom Bukovac <laughs> and 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 Brent Mason and, yeah, and Brent, Brent Mason. Rowan and guys that I've had a chance to work with in the studio, and you just sit and watch these guys not only be great guitar players, but be able to change styles and disciplines. Yes. To you can tell them uh, the a style of anything, and they'll go right to a reference of somebody they've studied in depth and be able to play exactly what you want and dial the sound up without you having to say much more. Dude, it's, it blows my mind. Session like, players are. Are, are a freaks, dude. They're freaks, man. I, and I, it's my that is my favorite part of the whole thing is getting into a studio and recording music with the best yeah. players in the world. That is my from. I love songwriting. I love performing, but recording music with players like that, there's nothing that gets me going. Where's your favorite that. studio in town, man? Honestly, uh, I, I'm I'm kind of an ocean way. I love back, ocean way back man. in the day, but uh, we do a lot of stuff at Blackbird still. Yeah. Um, 
but I like the vibe. I'm a vibe guy, and especially now because you can take everything back home and plugins and stuff. I can make anything sound really, really good. So to me, I'm just trying to get that vibe, and yeah. that church just looks. I like super I cool. like tracking with a full band too. I know a lot of people yeah. do things different now, but I think to get, I mean, things evolve when you get really talented people in a room that have yeah. good chemistry together. You, it, they might take it to a place that you would never have taken it if you just put a drum track down and started building stuff around it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I get the in the room that day, but you gotta have. I have to have life. I have to have air moving. Me too. I have yeah. to have human beings in there. I, I I don't trust myself enough anymore. And it could because I've been, you know, spoiled by the great, the greatness of this town and, and the humans here and the players here. So I need it. I'm like, yeah. I mean, could could I go in a room and make a record by myself right now? Yeah. Would it be great? Probably not. Because you know what's going to make it. At least in my to. at least in my mind, it would be. Yeah. I don't have to. I can come in here. That's part of signing a record deal, right? Yeah. I get to play music with the best players in the world now. And they really are, man. Not only the the musicians that are in town, but the whole recording process in the Nashville area, I think, is above. I mean, you can come in. I, I take a work tape in. You, your session leader will chart it out in about five minutes. <laughs> You'll talk your way through it. They'll go do a run through. Yeah. They might run it one, two, three times tops. Yeah. And then you're doing overdubs. You're yep. done. Yeah. <laughs> it blows my mind. Well, then that's the fun part. Then you get to be like, all right, I want to. I want this solo from this song. I want you know that. Once you get those bones laid out, then you then you get to like make them do the fun stuff. Hey, play play on a crazy banjo lick here that I could never think of. You know, it's that's just awesome, man. It's just really to cool. be surrounded with that energy in a room with some of those great players, man. I absolutely love yeah. everything about it. I love bringing friends and letting them watch too. Like, come on in, guys. Y'all come on in. Watch, watch, watch what I'm lucky enough to get to see. I want y'all to experience this. And it's so cool talking to them after because they had no idea. Oh, they didn't hear the song before the, today? And I was like, nah. Yeah, and you know, I've, uh, I'm have i friends with uh, a few rock groups. I won't mention any names. But I've, I've been where they'll come in and rent Ocean Way for like four months. Yeah. And right. they'll sit down. And that recording process is so wasteful to me. I mean, because we go and sh woodshed up and we write songs and we get our stuff together. They'll come in and write along the way. Yeah. I guess there is some kind of magic to it, but there's yeah. too many distractions. I mean, I just like, I like our process a little bit better. To me, though, and I agree, I mean, in my work for them, and I'm sure, I mean, I know amazing records have been written that way. Oh, my gosh, but, yeah. But it's not how I work, because then, then it would become boring for me and it would become too normal. Like, getting to do it, every, like, writing all the time, getting the songs ready, it's like there's the treat at the end of it. This is what you, this is what you're rewarded with by working hard and writing songs and having them prepared. Is you get to go in and record them now with the best players. Yeah, that's like for me. That's like that's what you build up to. That's how my brain works on it. But what did it feel like your first number one record? <sighs> Man, um, relief and anxiety at the same exact time. It was. I thought it would be. It's everything I ever wanted. Yeah. But then after that, I was. Can I do it again? immediately yeah immediately can i do it again and um but there was a good two-day period there where i really really was like man thank god and thank you and um you know here and let's do it again yeah and then, yeah but then it was like let's go right back to work and uh you know i think that's we're always chasing something that we're always what we're chasing is i guess we're, we're truly chasing ourselves man we're chasing we're chasing that we want to impress ourselves again every single time at least I am. It's like, man, I, I grew up playing sports. I thought I was going to play football, honestly, but I always loved guitar. And it got to that point where I realized it was like, man, you just, you ain't growing tall enough. You ain't big enough. Like, you ain't, you just ain't good enough. Boys are big. And boys are big. I got to run college into a and I was like, brick, yeah. freaking wall, man. They line I know. weigh 300 freaking pounds. Dude, <laughs> now the linebackers coming through there and just. It's a freak. It's I, I just don't get how they survive, you know, one play anymore, let alone a whole season. Because I've, I've stood down on the sidelines of the NFL games, and it's like a car crash every time they come off the line. No, it's it's stupid, and and I was just, I was just like, yeah, Mitchell, give it up, give up. That ain't it. And once I got that bug to really focus on doing this, it's everything I've ever wanted to do, and it's like you want to continue to prove yourself that you can do it. And so yeah, some of my favorite memories. Or feeling feeling the ride of that song going up the charts. Yes, you know you you feel a little bit when you get on the countdown when you get inside yeah. the top forty. Nothing really, it doesn't really change a lot till you get inside the top twenty. You can feel a little rumbling. Sure. And then you crack the top twenty, and then top ten, you can really feel it start to pick up momentum. Top five, it's getting more intense, and that's the intensity you're feeling from the crowd. And then oh to gosh, see the thing yeah. pick out, you it's 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 a it's tangible. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can taste oh, it. I yeah. still believe that with country radio, it is for me the 
where we grow the most. I mean, that first one, when it was drunk me, like you said, when it got to 20, the crowds were getting bigger. Mm-hmm. When it got to 10, they were singing back every word. And that is what that gives you every bit of energy that you've expelled throughout the year and through that song. You've got it all back. You can do anything in the world. You can fly. When they're singing your song back, <laughs> you can literally fly, man. It's the coolest thing in the world. And um, it, it is cool how you see it based on the decades on the chart as it goes down. It's like, oh, yeah, once it hits 20, once it hits 10, it's it's nuts, man. It is really pretty cool. It really is. And it's a journey that it's it, unless you've experienced it, it's hard to explain yeah. to somebody that it just because there's something that you get from that crowd that's just absolutely yeah. amazing. Jeez, man. Now you got to be pumped on that. I, <laughs> I was a little tired to get on the bus, but I'm ready to go now. <laughs> well, I know you got a lot of stuff to do. Let the boys ask a couple of questions if yeah, they want. Please. So Scott plays piano in the band. He does all the video. Yeah, awesome. Derek uh, Derek is, is the audio guy. He plays second guitar in the band. I stole awesome. him from a studio. He was an engineer on one of the albums that I did several years ago. Oh, wow. Ago, so awesome. I stole him out. Sound for him. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious about your time at MTSU. Yeah. Did you did you major in songwriting, or what was your major there? <laughs> yeah. Did it help? Did you you feel like that was helpful? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I did I did commercial songwriting, uh, but I did contracts and legal issues. Oh, God. Uh, I wanted to study how to protect myself if this ever did happen. Um, commercial songwriting was just you can't teach somebody how to write a song. It was mainly just surrounding yourself with other songwriters in school and making those kind of networking. Um, I was always doing, I was doing Pro Tools since I was 11 years old. So I did some engineering stuff, but my main focus was entrepreneurship and contracts. Oh. So I really wanted to learn everything about that part of the business. I thought I knew a lot about publishing going in, but I wanted to know about the music business more about the, than the playing and that side. I kind of knew that side. I've been doing it a lot. So the contracts was very important to me. Awesome. And that's kind of what I focused on. Very cool. Yeah. God, you just gave me nightmares. I graduated from MTSU as well. Oh, hell, and Blue Raiders, con- and baby. Dude, contracts and legal issues is what made me graduate in August <laughs> instead of... <laughs> I didn't say it was good. I just... I mean, I had to retake that one. It sucked. I hated that class. It was... Uh, yeah. I didn't I didn't enjoy it, but I, I will say, um, you know, as many contracts as I've had to sign, oh, yeah. it definitely helped um, as far as school. But I think school, all, all school really was, too, it's, it's, it's networking, man. I was never good at school. I just... I think what MTSU did for me is... It, you know, my whole band, I still have band members that are from there. My roommates that, you know, it connected me with people, like-minded people that wanted to do what I wanted to do more than what I learned from a book or a teacher. To be honest, I think college, that's all it was for me was a networking four and a half years or whatever it took. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Man, I, I graduated from the RIM program there with minor yeah. in entrepreneurship, but where I really learned all my stuff was the internships. I interned at Starstruck Studios, yeah. and then that led to the Sound Emporium thing, which led to Tracy. So, and Love MTSU, but my question for you, check this out. Uh-oh. What's an insult that you've received that you're the most proud of? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. That is a, <laughs> one of the greatest questions. I was thinking about mine on the way in this morning. I don't know if I could say it, but. Uh, <laughs> what's an insult that I'm proud about? Man, I, gosh, I'd have to think about that. I get a lot of insults. Uh, I don't know how many, I was proud, how many I'm proud of. Um, Somebody. Okay, here's one. Yes, actually, very recently, somebody was saying the other day, a radio station, I'm not going to mention it. Kim in Tucson. Yeah, <laughs> Kim in Tucson <laughs> was saying, uh, I mean, I like what you do, but you're just a little too much Michael Jackson. And I'm like, what? What? I mean, I'll take that. I love Michael <laughs> Jackson, but I like, just your inflections, the way you see it. And I mean, he started, and I'm like, okay. Um, I think you're trying to like me, but I'm like, I love it because I love Michael Jackson. So if you're throwing up, so I guess that that'd be one off the top of my head right there. Um, I think, or 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 the John Mayer too. Uh, you you sound too much like John Mayer. Your breath, you, the breath and your stuff. I'm like, I, I adore John Mayer. I think he's one of the greatest songwriters ever. So like, whatever you say, man, thank you. <laughs> but uh, I think yeah, getting compared to other artists trying to say like, don't sound or do that. Generally, for me, it's like, well, I probably was influenced by them, so that works out for me. But I'm interested to hear your Oh, man. So our band leader told me that I tune the way that old people um, engage in coitus. <laughs> so I was thinking, hmm. Well, if you just start tuning before I come out for sound check, you'd make things a lot better. Well, if he means, like, slowly and with precision, then I'm all about it, because you don't want to throw your back out while you're tuning. I mean... 
I'm all day. I'm oh my down. goodness! Oh, slowly with precision. I how love, I love your 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 <laughs> slow phrasing there, trying to get that out. I like, like that a lot, man. man that's good, <laughs> brother. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Luke Combs. Uh, he'll be out on tour with Luke Combs and Jordan Davis next year. Uh, it's a tenpenny.com, all socials and all. Yeah, all M, M, the number 10 penny, man. Yeah, I'm sure at this point, uh, if you want to get there, man, just just hopefully you can type in the name. Hopefully Sony's done right by me and you can find it somewhere. Proud of you, my friend. Thank you man, for spending a little you. time with me today. An honor. Give it up, Mr. Tenpenny. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers.